I'm just going to start off with, you know, a really quick intro as to who I am. So my name is uh, Heather McGarrigal and um, I'm a freelancer a slash sole trader trading as Quilink and I. Um, there's many different words really for what I do, but essentially I help best businesses to find the right words for their written content. I uh, specialize in working with small businesses and creative organizations. Um, so talking to you today is a bit of a dream gig for me, to be honest. I'm genuinely excited to share my knowledge with you and hopefully help you all create um, amazing content to reach your ideal customers and clients. Um, so I'll give a, a really quick background, hopefully, of my career and um, just give you a wee bit of insight into you know, how and why I came to do what it is I do. Um, I don't have a degree, but I knew when I left school I wanted to be a journalist. So when I screwed up my A-levels, I put plan B into action, which was uh, find a job in publishing. Um, I was amazingly lucky in finding a job um, at the Ulster Tatler magazine, doing admin and helping out with a bit of proofreading here and there, which was great. A few years later, I got a job as a receptionist at uh, Greer Publications. Um, when I applied for a job at uh, Northern Woman magazine, one of their publications, um, they took a, a chance on a, a keen newbie with no portfolio and a little bit of um, experience in proofreading copy. Um, so I worked on magazine teams, you know, as a staffer for a couple of years before going uh, freelance in 2008. Um, great timing just before the credit crunch hit, so that was epic. <laughs> um, but in 2010, I got my um, MBQ4 in newspaper writing, my first proper grown-up qualification, and freelanced for the Belfast Telegraph for a couple of years. Um, work became kind of thin on the ground, and I temp for a while. Um, I was working in manufacturing, got made redundant um, from a lovely sales job. So I kind of then had my you know, now or never moment in 2015 and kind of used my writing skills to set up um, Quilling NI in August of 2015. So, you know, I've kind of filled the work gaps throughout the years with bar work and waitressing, office, admin jo jobs throughout the public, the private and the charity sector. And um, I've had something like 15 different jobs since I left school um, nearly 20 years ago. And back then, my career path probably would have been considered fairly unconventional and um, maybe even directionless. But these days, it's less unusual to switch gears, take a sidestep um, or to have, you know, a self defined multidisciplinary career and um, the only thing that hasn't really changed for me is um, my love of writing throughout um, I love creating uh, written content getting it out into the world and the excitement when you can see people are reading it and you start to build an audience is the best feeling ever and that's what I really hope to um, to share with you today and put across um, sorry about all the noise here bear with me <laughs> Um, so yeah, I experienced this for myself for the first time when I actually started my own blog in 2011. It was around the time my journalism work was um, kind of a little bit quieter. And um, so I very much took a DIY approach to that, much as you guys are with your own websites and blogs, hopefully as well. Um, I taught myself how to set up websites, um, got my own domain name, how to use social media to promote content and build an audience. And these are skills I you know, use today for, um, for clients. So you can kind of see a wee bit how my plan B at the age of 18 might have you know, deviated from the norm a bit, but it has been a really rich and varied path. Um, thanks to all those jobs along the way, I've seen how businesses, charities, um, and arts organizations in the public sector works and the challenges um, they face. And that, you know, that really informs the work I, I do today for my clients. So hopefully it gives you a wee bit of an idea of, you know, what I do and, um, you know, why I'm here today, sort of talking to you about content. Um, all my socials and things that are up there, love you to follow me and, you know, chat about content. Um, you know, and I'm happy to follow up with anybody, you know, after if you don't get a chance to ask your question or, you know, we don't get to um, something, you know, a burning issue you wanted to cover. So with that out of the way, I'll crack on. Um, so yeah, obviously like the fact that you're all here, you, you know, um, you realize creating content is a good idea. So, um, I decided not to go into, you know, the whys and wherefores too much and just go straight, dive straight into, you know, what we're, um, what we're covering today. So, um, website content, obviously, um, writing with authenticity. I'm going to talk about, um, you know, how to find your, your voice is a bit of a cliche, but you know, I like that term, you know, finding your voice with writing, making your writing really sound like you. Um, and then a few tips and tricks for making your content go further. I have a system I developed called um, Core Content. Um, I find it's really effective for just using your energy and your time wisely because, you know, these are a limited supply when you're self-employed. Um, you know, particularly in the creative sector when you might be wearing more than 
uh, one hat at a time. Um, obviously blogging and social media and um, you know a bit of ideas around um, what people struggle with most is sort of creating you know what to write about, what to blog about um, and then sort of what platforms should I be on, should I be in all of them. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that and then we'll finish off with some um, going through some quite practical stuff so that's you know planning your content um batching it and uh, scheduling it out in advance so you're not you know content isn't taking up your time every single day um effectively so starting off with um creating a website um now again i'm only covering this really briefly because i really want to focus on the written content um side of things but you know if you're creating your own website um you know the first thing you do really is pick a platform and you know the the most popular ones out there, the ones I have experience with anyway, are WordPress, um, Squarespace and Wix. Those are the, the three big ones that generally seem to be um, considered quite good for, you know, doing it yourself, basically. Um, uh, WordPress um, also offers the opportunity to kind of um, to use your own host. That's a little bit complex. Um, it's a little bit beyond my um, skill set and probably would be you know, another workshop in and of itself. So we'll not go into that. Um, your own domain name, that's obviously buying your unique website address. Um, you can usually um, buy these via the, um, the platforms themselves. For example, my website's um, on WordPress. I, it's hosted on wordpress.com and I actually bought my domain name from them and, you know, for, for ease and, you know, relatively affordable option, you know, it's, it's one that I, I personally recommend, but again, there are people out there more knowledgeable about the, um, you know, creating websites, so I would, I would leave it up to them. And then finally, email hosting um, is something that you would want to think about if, if you're, you know, getting your site up and running for the first time um, and email hosting is, you um, probably quite self-explanatory. It's basically just connecting your domain name that you've purchased to um, an email account. So, you know, you can have a sort of professional looking email. Gmail and Outlook tend to be the most sort of, um, you know, popular uh, platforms for doing that. Um, so we'll move on to the juicy stuff. Um, we're talking about um, writing with website content and we'll start with writing your website. So these are the basics um, essentially. And I've kind of used, um, a bit of a, an analogy of, you know, a, a shop to, to kind of give you a bit of a visual on this, you know, it sort of represents your, your buyer's journey. I think these, these basic components of a website sort of represent um, your buyer's journey around your website. So if you almost visually imagine them traveling around a website and, you know, the different information, uh, bits of information they pick up and, you know, eventually the, you know, the buyer's journey that they go on. So your homepage, that's really, you know, that's your shop floor, your shop window, um, you know, it showcases what you do and it invites um, a closer look. Um, the about section, and you might even want to have a, another page that's about me, if you're a sole trader and you want to talk separately about your journey versus your, you know, your, the business journey. Um, you know, someone, on this page wants to know a bit more about the business and um, this is a chance to start building a relationship a human relationship um potentially with your clients so you know it's it's a bit cheesy but i like to think about that as sort of chatting on the shop floor the person behind the business um next you need um a well probably either a page or several pages um you know comp depending on the volume of you know products you're offering or services um you know and this is equivalent to you know somebody browsing through your shop they're sort of looking at what you have and they're thinking about whether they want to buy and whether it's right for you and um, good example to um, include you know things like a portfolio a gallery maybe client testimonials in here and um, but I'll go into that in a wee bit more detail later as well and then finally um, a contact page Um, you know the person's kind of heading towards the till at this point if they want to get in touch with you they want to ask you a question you know, it's safe to assume that unless they're complaining about something, you hope that's not happening. Um, you know, they have either bought already, maybe have a follow up question or they're intending to they're con they're considering it. So it's an important page. There's not a huge amount of um, content on it or copy. You know, I nearly would call it micro um, copy, but it's still important to consider. It's still, a, you know, a good opportunity to to put across your personality, really, and differentiate yourself. So going into each of those elements in a wee bit more detail then. So on the home page, um, what the content needs to do, it needs to reassure um, your visitor that they're in the right place. First of all, you know, they've obviously come to you um, to, you know, to find something to answer a question. Your home page really needs to reassure them quite quickly 
they're in the right place. If it confuses them, they won't want to go any further in the website. They'll have no reason to because, you know, they won't really understand what's happening there. So next, you kind of have to summarize what you do, what you're offering, what you're selling. Um, it needs to be concise enough to hold their attention, um, but yet detailed enough to give them the information they need. It's, it's a difficult balance, um, but it definitely is possible. And um, I do have a few examples I'd like to show as well. I might do that at the end and um, once I come out of the, the presentation. Um, so, and then yes, uh, your, your USBs, you need to kind of sell it. You need to sort of, um, you know, tell them what's unique about you and give them a reason to stick around, you know, um, give them a compelling reason to explore your website further and then finally you definitely need a call to action you need to direct them where do they go next in the website and um, you know and again reinforcing that idea of uh, a journey around your website um so how to do it then this is the the real important stuff um the details of, of how to do that so uh keyword research basically um you want to start with what are the questions that your, your clients, your potential customers, um, they might be asking, what are the problems they have that you can solve or you know, they're hoping you'll be able to solve? What needs or desires do they have um, you know, that are bringing them to you? Answering these questions um, is important because it can reveal really useful words and phrases that you might not um, have considered previously. And that's why it's important to look at it at this stage. You can use those words and phrases on the homepage itself, you can also use the likes of you know Google keyword research to you know put those terms and words in, and even see what Google throws up and gives you um, new ideas alongside um, that research that you find out. So uh, yeah, so if you are already if you, sorry, excuse me. Um, so yeah, just don't assume you know exactly what brings people to you and um, it's important to ask them if you're already trading remember to ask your customers and clients um, how they find you why they choose you and um, what keeps them coming back you know, think about the different ways they might have found you too did they click through from your social media perhaps um, or did they find you um, via some of your paid um, advertising that could be online or even um, offline more traditional um, advertising so if so your call to action is working um, more of the same you know uh, that's really good feedback um so if they came via um a referral a great review or a link on someone else's website or social media you want to know what those people are saying about you that's encouraging those people to click through to your website what are the words and the phrases and the ideas that are common between you know in if you're getting good reviews um you know what are people saying about you in, in their social media content on their websites what are the words and the phrases and the ideas that keep coming up because those are things that you should really be focusing on um yep so google analytics is your best bet really for tracking where your visitors are, are um uh, are coming from um so whether that be other websites or facebook for example what they're searching for to find you um that's really to be honest um a workshop in itself so uh there's a pretty comprehensive article i have um th that kind of walks you through it and again i you know if you want the slides after this i can provide that or i can provide that um you know that article as well um, and if you don't yet have any customers or clients um, you know this is a good opportunity to maybe um, do some market research create a survey to ask these questions analyze the answer you can use things like survey monkey or google forms um, to to gather responses from people um, you know to ask them what kind of you know questions problems issues would they be searching for answers for from a business like yours you know just to get a bit of an idea as to um you know what problems you could be solving for them um you know it's good business research as well as um good research for your um your content as well so moving on to talking about um your voice it's it's really conveying you know your personality a lot of you guys are um you know, maybe soul traders, you know, your one man bands, one person bands. Um, so it is a lot about your your personal personality, but also about um the brand identity um that you're you're hoping to create there. Um so 
you know, with creative businesses, chances are even, you know, the earliest stage startups, you have at least an emerging idea of that brand identity and, you know, the values that matter to you and to your business. Um, anything that sets you apart in a, you know, a positive or at least not negative way um, is some part of what makes you unique. And it's definitely something um, you can capitalize on. Like, so yeah, keyword research. Um, we've covered, yes, we covered that pretty um comprehensively the keyword research there so again you know we're probably repeating a wee bit there the need the problem the questions that they're they're coming to you with what did they go oh there's that um that article i mentioned there actually we've got the link there so if you want to maybe take a wee screenshot of that um it's a really comprehensive guide to using google analytics it's basically um a facility that Google offer you put a little bit of code on your website and it allows you access to actually track um, a lot of, of data such as you know search terms that people use to, to get to your website where they came from so you can see if people are clicking through from Facebook and what types of posts are coming through so it gives you a lot of really good information about um, you know what is bringing people to your website which you really should use to inform um your content so we've covered so again i'm um, talking about what uh, defines your voice um you know once you've defined the personality and the values at the heart of your business choosing the right word should hopefully come naturally um writing how you speak um can actually be really effective and um, you know there's a reason why we talk about um this type of writing as your voice and it sounding like you you know if it literally sounds like you that's probably a good thing um you know and again i used to advise a you know a blanket ban on things like you know swear words overuse of punctuation loads of exclamation marks and um, you know and i also used to think that spell you know mistakes and spelling uh, and grammar instantly ruined content. Um, but one of my favorite things about language is that it's alive and it's ever changing. And the same can be, is obviously said of, of written content. So many of us are, you know, creating and um, consuming content, particularly online these days, that it's become quite democratized. And I actually think that's a really positive thing. Um, you know, you can view it as, you know, standards have fallen, um, but I prefer to see it as a removal of barriers to entry. Um, I don't believe anybody should be put off sharing their thoughts, ideas and businesses with the world because of imperfect spelling or their enthusiasm for uh, exclamation marks. Um, but that said, you know, if writing is an important part of your job, like it is mine, obviously, um, you know, or if your business needs or wants to show itself as, you know, quite formal or, you know, maybe highly um, detail oriented, um, then check your P's and Q's. Um, Consistency, I know that's not, that's a bit of a strange thing. Sometimes it can be quite jarring if you read con uh, content that has little inconsistencies in it, you know, such as, um, you know, writing out 4.30, but then later referring to it um, uh, with, num you know, using numbers. So uh, just something to consider, you know, it might, it might not annoy everybody, but it's just, um, you know, something to consider. And again, if you, um, if you are interested in, you know, putting across quite um, a formal impression of your business, um, you can check out style guides. The likes of the BBC and the Times um, usually have uh, updated links to those that, you know, they kind of show certain rules for using language. And, you know, they can be quite a good, um, a good place to start if you're looking for, you know, some, some guidance on that. So, yeah, now we're moving on to the detail of um, your about page or pages. And this is, you know, quite obviously, it's telling the story of your business. Um, I personally think this is probably the easiest and most enjoyable part of your website to write. And um, there's very few rights and wrongs here. Um, you know, you can talk about the business, you talk about how it came to be, what it stands for, um, you know, its achievements, your personal achievements, the work it has done. And then you can have, you know, slightly separate to that, um, you know, personal profiles of you and you know even any staff you have or you can you know you can blend those stories together if you like um you know and again if you're like me a sole trader um your business story is part you know sort of intertwined with your your personal story so um absolutely appropriate um the thing about about pages uh, is that they can probably not be too long um if someone if a reader is on your about page they're interested in you so you can make these pages lengthy you don't have to share as much or as little as you're comfortable um, sharing about yourself and your business. But um, 
don't be don't shy away um from longer content um google search engines they like wordy content they like you know um long form content so that will be quite good for your search engine optimization or seo um again remember a call to action um this you've got to keep in mind that idea of um the journey around your website you want to keep the person on your website as long as possible so you want to encourage them to go somewhere rather than just tailing off at the end of the page and you know maybe losing interest you need to remind them there's um you know there's other places uh, on the website to go um basically so moving on to services um so obviously i'm going to look at products as well but we'll start with um you know services because obviously you take a slightly um different approach um to both of those things so for services um fab content refers to features advantages and benefits and big hat tip to eczema marketing who you know basically came up with um this concept as far as i'm aware it was it was andy um jarvis from eczema marketing that um you know, first introduced me to this to this idea of FAB or it should really be BAF. Um, remember to talk first about the benefit to your customer or client of the service um, that you're offering. What exact aspect of their life gets easier? That's what you should be talking about first. It's really tempting to kind of, you know, talk about your amazing features and, um, you know, all the things that you're so proud of about the service that you've created. But um, you really should focus on the problem that you solve for them. That's why they're here. You know, you're reverse engineering their thinking, if you like. You know, they're on your website to find out if you can fix their problem or, you know, provide something they need. Um, the so what test, um, it's a little bit brutal, but it's effective every time you want to write something um, on your services page, say to yourself, so what, <laughs> you know, and just what does that actually mean? Why should the client care? So what? So uh, it's like I said, a bit brutal, but, um, you know, it's a good way to, to cut through the rubbish <laughs> Um, you know, outline your processes. That's um, pretty straightforward. You know, if someone's going to engage you to provide a service they want to know exactly what you will need from them so i find it's it's really really helpful um almost necessary i would say to describe exactly what they can expect from you you know talk about your onboarding processes um and you know get them ready for you know do as much of, of the work as you can before they get in touch with you so they're kind of prepared maybe you know even get some of this information ready for you if you need some information um before you maybe take them on um, as a client um, pricing it's really the endless question for service based businesses you know do you show your pricing or not um, you know there's there's strong reasons for and against um, if you decide not to show your pricing um, a lot of people you know kind of shy away from the idea of you know showing their pricing to you know rivals who might undercut them but and there's also the fact that if you offer a service it's highly likely that um, you work in quite a bespoke way and you know you you won't actually really know what your prices or your fees are for a particular client unless you, until you know exactly what it is they want um, from you exactly. So um, there are a few options for kind of um, not getting around it, but giving people an idea of your pricing without um, you know having a, a rate card, a traditional rate card, or a price list. Um, so you can signature service if you could maybe even define an example of something you can do um, or even put together an example package like for example for me I could um, you know put together you know oh, two blog posts certain amount of social content and um, a newsletter every month will cost x amount of pounds and um, that way it kind of gives people an idea you know they can sort of frame in their head okay well that's a bit more a bit less than what I would need so it gives them an idea before um, they get in touch with you and it might help them to get past that friction of you know, I don't want to get in touch before I know what it costs. Um, another idea is just simply to um, to describe the, the affordability. You know, um, is it affordable for startups with small budgets, for example? You know, describe who it would work for. Give some people an idea of the ballpark they're in. Um, or you can um, just actually explain exactly how you reach your pricing. You know, do, clearly define all the variables you take into consideration um, when you're quoting um, a price or a fee. Um, 
again on these pages it's really um important to have if you have them um testimonials from happy customers case studies are really really powerful pieces of um long form content basically just telling the story of um a successful customer journey basically um so you i usually do it in in three chunks you start off with the problem they had um the solution you offered them and then the result at the end of it you know how they were they were left better off um they're they're really easy to put together and they're really effective ways of of helping people to imagine themselves um engaging your services so um yeah and again obviously portfolios and examples of work that really speaks for itself you know um if you have relevant you know for for example myself i've got you know examples of articles i've written before you know social media content links to websites um i've written things like that just to give people an idea of the um you know the the range of work i've done and, and my abilities and again as with every page on your website, a call to action, send them somewhere relevant. Now maybe send them to your content page or your contact me page, sorry. So moving on again to products, um, particularly if you have lots and lots of um, products, you really need clear categories um, and descriptions. Um, try to group them into sensible categories without over categorizing. You want to make it easy and pleasant um, to find what they want, but also easy and pleasant to, to browse. The longer they stay on your site, the, the more likely they are to, to stay, to buy and to spend more. Um, obviously, including all variables, you know, think of all the, the different options you offer use that content be as descriptive as you can so people know exactly what it is they're being offered um, it'll help them reach that purchase decision um, obviously clear instructions and how to order that's probably pretty self-explanatory um, you know again if if what you do in, in your creative business and um, maybe you're an artist um, or you know you offer the option to commission work don't assume that your client understands how that process works. Spell it out, every single detail, even if you think it's really obvious, make it easy for them. Um, and again, as with the services, reviews, testimonials and customer stories, um, it's, you know, it's social proof. It's known as um, you're showing people that you're good at what you do. You're showing them happy customers um, and you're letting their experience um, speak for you so it builds um credibility and, and builds trust and again a call to action send them somewhere on your site there we go and um quite finally the contact page um and again you know this is they're sort of moving towards a purchase at this stage if they're here they're interested in some way um obviously there's many different reasons they might be wanting to contact you if you have preferences for people contact you in different ways like if you if you have a certain process for booking a call and making an order um, and that's maybe hosted on a different part of your website that's in a shop direct them there um, if you know if you have different processes for each of these different types of um of contact requesting more information having a you know posing a question maybe sending in a complaint or praise if you have clear processes and you deal with those in different ways or via different channels make sure that's clear again make it easy for them and um, i'm a big fan of contact forms on um, websites again it's just another you're reducing another step that they have to take to get in touch with you you're making it easy you're reducing friction so make the contact form as minimal and simple to use as possible i usually don't you don't really need any more than you know their name their contact information um and their message and it's really important to make sure that you have that set up properly so that you actually receive their message to your email so in the back end of your website just check your settings and make sure that's all um that's all set up properly and finally if you find that you're getting the same questions or the same types of questions over and over again that's like a massive massive you know sire and a blaring sign that that should be a piece of content that you create whether it's a blog post or whether it's a permanent page on your website if people have the same question over and over again that's you know that's that's a gap in the knowledge that you're giving them so um you know faqs great um content ideas so moving on then to um, what I call the core content method. So I created this method. This is you know, a method for creating content. A lot of people get really overwhelmed with the idea of creating content 
regularly for their businesses and um, particularly when it comes to things like um social media um you know and blogging and things like that so i created this method to make um content creation kind of as energy efficient as possible and also to play to the strengths um of you the creator so it's it's quite um personalized you pick one as i call chunky piece of content you know it's a it's a long form piece of content it you know be quite high value um you know quite detailed um so you pick whichever one you prefer your favorite it's you know pick your poison so whether you know some people prefer to um to put their thoughts down in writing. Some people find their more natural speaking and, uh, you know, videos and live streams can be good for people like that, as can podcasts. So pick your favorite, whether that's, you know, I'm going to go with blogs, so create your core content. Um, yep, so if you want your original core content to be a video or podcast, you can transcribe the video. Um, and polish it up into a blog post. So you can quickly convert your sort of chosen type of core content into another piece of chunky content, if you like. Um, and, ah, there we go, sorry, I missed out a, a step there, <laughs> forgive me. Um, so yeah, if writing is what comes most naturally to you and you decide to go for, um, for a blog, on the other hand, um, that blog could then form um, a script um, of, of sorts for um, a video, a live stream or a webinar. Um, the final kind of piece of the puzzle that um, makes it you know, really effective is you can record a video, um, a live stream and a podcast all at the same time. So you could be recording your voice while you're um, live streaming slash recording yourself on video and you're kind of creating three pieces of content in one go, three parts, one stone. So, you know, I'm always looking for, you know, any shortcuts like that, that, um, you know, still create really good quality content, still focus on really good quality content, but um, put your energy and your time to good use. Excuse me. And then the next step in the core content um, method is then taking that piece of core content and repurposing it into um, micro content for your social media channels. Um, so I've put a few examples of that type of content. You can just have um, very simple promotion posts for the core content, just a post saying, this is our latest blog post, or this is our podcast, and you know, here's the link to go and enjoy it, here's what it's about. Um, or you can take, if there's you know, really interesting, um, useful bits of advice um, or quotes, you know, quotable, um, bits of, of your your article or your podcast you know your core content that you've created you can pull out quotes and you can use my old good old favorite um canva to create like infographics and little quote graphics and um, obviously if you're a designer that'll come really naturally to you can you can you can make some really nice um visually appealing bits of content um and you can even use your core content as um, the basis for creating short form videos. So if you think of the likes of Reels, those um, little short videos that are on uh, Instagram, um, stories, which are basically across all the platforms now, there's you know stories on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, even on LinkedIn, I think. Um, so yeah, so you can take you know some of the key moments, the key takeaways from that longer, bigger piece of content and make those, um, you know, short form content for um, for vertical stories, TikToks, that type of thing. And then finally, um, take that core piece of content or more than one piece of core content um, and add it to um, a newsletter and send out to your, um, your mailing list. Um, I like to do this by putting sort of a snippet or an intro to the content and then a link that takes um, the person through to the original um, core content. Because again, if that's you know, a blog on your website, um, you're driving more traffic, you know, to your website, which is great. So this is um, a really beautiful and detailed diagram that I've done with all of my artistic skills to kind of give an idea of the direction of flow and how the core content method um, works. So um, it's pretty self-explanatory, you know, it's, um, you know, the, the blog gets turned into, into a podcast and vice versa. Um, and then, you you know, you can turn those core bits of content into social media and put it out in your mailing list. So it's just a nice little visual representation. It wasn't meant to be um, anything too complex. 
So um, moving on then to um, a bit more detail on blogging then, if you decide that's um, you know, the core co content um, you want to, to focus on. You know, those key content pillars um, kind of cover everything that good content does. It tends to either educate, inform, entertain, inspire, or affect, you know, to create some emotions in, in someone, you know, to affect them emotionally. Um, and it's a bit cheesy, but this just really appeals to me. I remember it by going E-I-E-I, -E -I, oh, for emotion. Um, so yeah, it's like creating genuinely useful content on a regular basis. Um, it really is one of the best way to, ways to raise the visibility of your business, get more eyeballs on your website, more engagement with your social media. Um, and long term, it does, it's a really, really effective at getting, um, at getting more customers and clients. Um, and the reason is it positions you as someone who genuinely knows what it is they're talking about and gives their knowledge away for free, which can be a bit counterintuitive um, for people sometimes but it all helps to raise your profile and create trust in you you know when, when someone needs or wants what you do they're more likely to you know to to remember you and think about you and um you know a lot of people again are quite resistant to the idea of giving their knowledge away for free or giving away you know their the trade secrets um but it's, it's my experience that most people you know when they when they consume content, you know, say you're doing a tutorial or something like that, um, you know, they're definitely more likely to to watch you do the thing and then decide to hire you to do the thing than do it themselves. So it really is a good way to, you know, position you um, as an expert in your field. Again, those are just um, some uh, topic ideas. You know, this is something that people really um, struggle with you know just getting a bit more specific about the type of content that you can create and um, behind the scenes showing your process meeting the team you know anything that gives people a better idea of you know what your business is how you do what you do and um, we're curious and we're, we're nosy naturally as human beings so um that type of content tends to go down really well particularly on social and again those short form videos like um reels and, and stories um industry news again helps to show that you you know what you're talking about you're you're active and knowledgeable about the industry that you're in again the customer you know the frequently asked questions jargon explainer is um a brilliant source of content because there's so many you know maybe technical terms or industry specific terms that you just use as part of your normal vocabulary that people might not even know what it means so you can create some content really easily and simply just by you know explaining um, what certain terms mean um, or explaining maybe common misconceptions you know doing a bit of myth busting about your industry and um, things like checklists um particularly good for service-based businesses you know like for example you know i could create um you know a, a checklist of you know things to make sure you have for good social media content um or you know i could even convert part of this workshop into a checklist you know here's the basics to have in a good website um and then seasonal content is a bit of a, a no-brainer you know depending on what your business is you could you know a, a christmas gift or gift guide could be appropriate um if your target uh customer is you know families or people with children you could um talk about summer holiday activities you know things that are relevant um to you know the, the people that you want to to reach um and then just a little bit um of advice on writing for an audience um, it's a little bit uh, cheesy, but um, it was a, a trick that I learned in my journalism days. Um, it's called the six honest serving men. Let's see if I actually remember the little rhyme. Um, I, I keep six honest serving men. They taught me all I knew. Their names are what and why and when and how and where and who. And it's just a nice little thing to, you know, if you're going over your content, um, just to make sure that you've you've kind of covered all the angles, you've included all of the details to make it, you um, you know, a, a useful piece of content um, for your audience. It's just another useful little um, checklist to have. Um, that second point is again, probably reiterating um, what I've, uh, you know, kind of covered before, but basically all in relationships and interactions, any kind of contact you have with the people that you want to sell to, or that you want to be part of your audience, there are opportunities to find out what they want, have conversations in as many different ways as you can. It's a bit hard at the minute, we're doing it all virtually, but, um, you know, I guess it's one of the benefits of us being so kind of uh, hyper-connected. 
as a society is that you know we can um you know we can ask these questions we can reach people a lot more easily these days um you know on a wider way than than we used to be able to right for a bright 12 year old that looks like a really strange quote um floating in there all by itself but it's one of the pieces of advice again from my journalism um studies that really stuck with me um my teacher my news writing teacher said that a good rule of thumb when you're writing for newspapers is to imagine you're writing for a bright 12 year old and I know it might sound a bit condescending and possibly a bit patronizing but it's actually really good advice to make sure that your content is it's always clear but it's not dumbed down either um so hopefully that makes sense. I've I've always found it quite a good, you know, obviously with you know obvious, you know, exceptions, but it's not a bad rule of thumb when you're, you know, creating content to make sure that most people reading it um, you know, should should be able to understand it. Um again, so moving on to social media um and talking about choosing what platforms to be on, which you know is is the top question. It's it's usually the first thing a client asks me is, you know. What platform should I be on? I've got, you know, I've got an account on all of them. <laughs> um, and, you know, you can be a bit more selective. It really is up to you. Like if you really want to be on all those platforms and you, you know, social media is something that you enjoy, go for it, fill your boots. Um, but the process for creating and publishing content um, on social media and, you know, choosing the right platform for it is probably quite similar to the marketing process. So again, you might have done that. Um, a long time ago, it might be an ongoing thing you do, you might be just, um, you know, doing it now as a startup, but you know, you start off with research, um, and you define your target market, um, or market segments, um, and that in turn, um, informs the creation, um, and packaging of your product or your service, and then finally you bring it to market, you advertise it, you make it available in the places real or virtual, where your target will see it, and you know buy it buy it hopefully um or you know browse it be aware of it um and it's a very similar process with content marketing which is effectively what this idea of creating useful content that's not directly selling to people um and publishing that regularly is you know you define your audience and um, that informs the content that you create and then you publish it where you believe your audience will see it and engage with it where you think they're most um where they're most likely to do that. So, so yeah, basically these stats are just taken from um, a survey done by a company called Sprout Social. They're a social media marketing company. Um, I believe they offer a sort of social media um, content scheduling platform, but that's by the by. Um, these stats were gathered um, earlier this year. I believe it was only about a month ago. So they're, they're fairly well up to date. So on the left-hand side under each of the, um, the platforms, um, I've listed, you know, the number of monthly active users, the largest age group, um, the gender divide there. Um, you know, it's a shame that they they don't have maybe non-binary. It's that's you know that is a little bit you know black and white, but still, you know, we're hopefully making progress in that area. And then finally, um, you know, the time spent per day, or you know, an idea of the amount of time that they spend um, on that platform. This is all really useful information that you can use, couple it with um, the work that you've done to define who your ideal customer is, and look at these stats and see if you can, you know, it will get, should give you a picture of um, whether this platform is right for you or not. Um, on the right hand side there, I've, um, I've put a couple of shall we say preconceptions or kind of cliched ideas um that people tend to have about these platforms um whether they're still true or not is arguable but then i've kind of followed that up with um it, the bold statement there is um something that you you know my it's it's very much my take on on what you know a lesser known fact about these platforms um but yeah, we all know, you know, Facebook is, I hope it doesn't sound too insulting. I don't mean it in a nasty way. You know, lots of mums and aunties on Facebook, um, the younger generation, uh, generations Z tend to steer clear. Um, but, and what a lot, what people might not know about it is that there are a lot of really helpful um, and active business groups, and um, particularly in Northern Ireland. Um, and, you know, for 
uh, sole traders such as um, myself and probably a lot of you as well. Um, Freelance Heroes off the top of my head is a, is a really good group. Um, yeah, and then moving on to Instagram, obviously everybody knows about, you know, the influencers, the Insta models, you know, just showing you the highlight reel. Um, but there's actually a lot of content on Instagram at the minute. I don't know whether it's something they're actively promoting to get away from this, um, this sort of superficial um, conception people have of Instagram, but there's a lot of um, body positivity um, and authenticity um, in the content, particularly in their Reels content that they're pushing out at the minute. So um, yeah, really interesting um, evolution of that platform. Um, Twitter, again, we all know um, its most famous now banned user who shall not be named. Um, we know it's quite a noisy political space. Um, it's got a reputation for fake news, um, but there are some really brilliant examples of storytelling on Twitter. Um, people are using the thread function really brilliantly and it's one thing that I've always liked about Twitter Um, I've been on Twitter since I think the year actually was launched and it is unrecognizable to the platform it was back then because the Twitter observe what it, what its users do how it uses the platform and it amends the platform to make it more usable so things like tweet threads and um, that's now a function of Twitter you you know you can create a tweet thread people just used to reply to their own tweets and sort of hack it um, there's lots of other examples that actually escape me right now but yeah um, Twitter is is a fantastic platform for conversations connections and storytelling even though it is quite fast-paced Again, LinkedIn, um, everybody knows it as the sort of, you know, kind of cringy business group. Um, and there's a lot of, you know, saying so and so congratulations for being in their job for 10 years and stuff that doesn't really add an awful lot of value. Um, but LinkedIn, to my knowledge, is one of the few platforms that doesn't yet have um, a Facebook type type algorithm. So you'll actually find that you can still, you know, you're, when you put content um you know, you publish a post on LinkedIn, people, it will still show up in people's feeds up to like a week later. Um, so that helps, you know, basically more people see your content and that's really, you know, hard to achieve, you know, organically um, these days. Again, Pinterest, you know, it's, if you're not familiar with it, it's a very visual platform. It is, um, you know, people look on it for kind of aesthetic inspiration, you know, um, so it probably is known, it, you know, it's literally as a, as a pin board, you're sort of pinning things to little boards for ideas and inspiration. Um, but what people don't really think about a lot with Pinterest, it is, it is a search engine. It's a really powerful search engine and your content really, really sticks around. If you put good content on um, Pinterest, particularly good for, you know, kind of crafting businesses, makers, craftspeople, anything that's, you know, visual um, like that. Um, so many, you know, creative businesses can do really well on Pinterest. You will find one piece of content will continue to generate interest, pins and visits to your website um, literally for years. So it's a really underrated platform. And again, TikTok, we all know about, you know, it's, um, lots of young people a bit of an echo chamber and all the silly dances but um there's a lot of really really high quality educational content on tiktok um which i think is um a growth area there at the minute so definitely worth considering if um you have any sort of educational or, or teaching content you want to share um there we go and again that's just some really simple tips about um you know all of your content really really you know fairly basic stuff but um it is important to you know to check your your spelling and grammar if you have the time to um you know word and most kind of um typewriting you know packages have a, a, an inbuilt spell checker um grammarly is a really useful um app and tool because you can set it up on your computer and it will actually spell check the content that you type into social media one of the best pieces of content or advice i can give to you with any kind of content particularly that long form you know chunky content um if it's written content is get a second pair of eyes on it and particularly someone outside of your industry um, because again, it is so, so easy. I've done it myself to use, you know, terms, acronyms, um, you know, shortened forms of words and, and forget to explain them or just assume that everybody knows what, um, what that means. So having somebody outside your industry, um, 
is, is a really good idea to check your content. Reading it out loud is an underrated trick for making sure that your content actually makes sense. Um, it can it's the best way to find if you if you're missing punctuation. And, you know, again, if it actually makes sense, it's so easy to miss a word here or there. And you only notice it when you actually physically read it out to yourself. And then again, just simply how the writing actually looks on the page, just simple stuff, font, spacing, layout. Is there enough space? Is, does it look crowded? You know, is it comfortable on the eye? And yeah, finally moving in to the sort of the kind of practical bit of making content creation, regular content creation, more to the point, you know, the likes of blogging and that um, core content, um, fitting it into your life, because I think that's, you know, the, the thing that puts people off um, creating content is that it just feels overwhelming. It just feels like there is a huge amount of things to do. And like you could, and you could actually, you know, obviously content can be a full-time job, but you could be, you know, do it, um, all day, every day. So in order to fit it into your life, um, planning it in advance really is the first thing to do. I like to plan a month ahead, but at least two to four weeks ahead to give yourself a little bit of, um, you know, space to think ahead and give yourself time to, you know, to to research, to create the content. Um, like I say, you know, start with your core, your core content and decide, okay, how many, say, if you're working, you know, in the, I think it's working in the calendar month is the, is the simplest way to do it. How many pieces of core content um, do I want to publish a month? Um, I think one a month is a really good start, you know, just to give you an idea of how long it takes you to create a piece of content like that. Um, you know, how much energy it requires of you, um, how much time, all that, those sorts of things. So maybe you can start off by just, just with one and see how you get on. Um, you know, one every week is obviously amazing. I, I don't think you should really do any more than two a week. Again, that's a lot. I don't think anybody DIYing their content is gonna be doing two chunky pieces of content um, a week. If you are, well done, you will see, <laughs> you will definitely see, um, you know, the, a payoff from that. So once you've decided how many, then you can think about your topic. And again, we, you know, we previously talked about um, a few ideas for topics um, and then decide um, the date that you'd like to publish that. Um, then once you've decided your core content, um, you can think about your satellite content. So that is your little mini pieces of content that you're gonna pull out um, from that core piece of content because obviously that gives you numerous pieces of content so whereas you might post one core piece of content and um, hopefully that's given you three chunky bits of, at least one but possibly a maximum of three chunky bits of content that you can then chop into various bits of micro content for your social media so decide you know do you want um you know, a couple of posts on each platform per week? Do you want to post something every day? Do you only want to post once or twice a week? You know, decide what works for you and, and don't be afraid to experiment as well. Um, then you need to create a detailed checklist of tasks for each content piece. So, you know, use this to brainstorm, you know, write out all your ideas. What do you need to do to create that piece of content? Who do you need to speak to? What information do you need? Um, is it just a case of sitting down and emptying your head onto a bit of paper? Or do you need to make some calls? Do you need to collaborate with anyone on that piece of content? Um, just write it out bit by bit by bit. If you were, imagine you're trying to describe to someone else, give someone else a little instruction sheet of how to put together this piece of content, write down everything so that you can tick off. And it also gives you an idea um, of these sort of like mini deadlines to work to. Um, which I, you know, talk about next. So put the, the published dates onto the calendar. And by that, I mean the date that you're going to publish your core piece of content and the, the several dates that you're going to post then your satellite content, your social media um, content that comes off of that piece of core content. And then after that, you can, you can slot in um, the deadlines for your checklist items. So when do you have to get each, bit, each checklist item done before you will have that piece of content either published or scheduled to be published. Um, hopefully that all makes sense. So then moving on to um, batching, obviously. Um, batching is again, a way of avoiding content just being something that you're plugging away at every single day. Um, 
I advise it's a really good idea to designate, you know, either just, you know, one day, a week, a fortnight, a month, um, or maybe several days or you know, half days, whatever works for you, but designate, you know, this day or this half day is all about creating my content. Um, put that on the calendar. Um, that can be a paper calendar. I use Google Calendar quite a lot. Um, I will also show you um, some online platforms that I use for planning content and, um, you know, for managing deadlines and things like that as well. Um, again, with batching, batch similar tasks together, I find is, is good for managing, you know, your reserves of, of energy. So things like, you know, have a day or half a day or even a few hours dedicated to, you know, the research element, maybe photography if you're creating your own images, um, you know, phone calls if you're collaborating with someone or interviewing or, um, you know, doing some person to person research and then the actual writing or content creation itself. Um, and there's other ways that you can batch as well. You can batch by topic. So maybe you want, might want to spend one portion of the day just working on one piece of content or one type of content and then move on to the next. Or you might want to, you know, group your content calls together with your business calls and just, um, that might be the best use of your time as well. So, and then we finally move on to the scheduling aspect of it. Um, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and uh, Pinterest are all, you can schedule content to all of those platforms in advance. And I don't think there's any limit actually to, as to how far in advance you can literally plan contents, content months um, in advance if you know if you so desire. Excuse me. Um, Facebook actually allows you to uh, schedule content natively, so that's within Facebook itself. Um, I recommend that the best way to do this is through Facebook Creator Studio. And that's the link there for it if you want to take a note or, or take a screenshot there. Um, the reason I like it is because if you have a Facebook page and an Instagram account, you can link them together through Facebook Creator Studio and you can access um, both of those platforms and schedule content to them. You can schedule content to Facebook feed or Facebook pages, sorry. Um, your Instagram feed and your IGTV, unfortunately, you can't yet um, schedule Instagram stories. Um, natively but I think that is something um that's coming and just while I remember there is actually an app called Storito S-T-O-R-R-I-T-O -R -R um there is a charge for it um it's I don't think it's free um but I have used it for scheduling stories and it is very effective it's a little bit clunky but um it, do it does work um very well so and then um the other types of content um or the other platforms sorry twitter linkedin and pinterest you can only schedule to them as far as i'm aware um at the minute through third party apps so that's basically an app that is not um you know owned by or within the platform itself and um, these are literally just some examples of you know the biggest well most well-known ones but there are so so many um social media social media schedulers and um, the best thing really to do is to go by personal recommendation or simply just to search a few and try them out for yourselves it, most of them will offer um free trials and um, they have sort of limited use for um the, where they won't you know ask for any money from you there's you know there's free accounts but there's very limited amounts of of content you can publish from them but it might be you know depending on what you decide is the right amount of content for you you know, a free um, scheduler might be all you need. Um, let me see. Before I go on to the question bit, um, I was going to show, there was a few things that I wanted to actually show you so now that I can come out of um, this without worrying whether it will die on me. <laughs> so I wonder if I can move you out of my way. Bear with me again, folks. Ah, oh, there we go. That's better. Um, so what I wanted to do was actually show you a little bit of my own um, content planning. Uh, just how that looks for me, just to give you some ideas. Um, I use a project management tool called Asana. Um, you might have heard of it. You might have heard of similar things. Um, the likes of Trello, Notion 
are quite well known um, tools that do you know very similar things. So obviously because you know I work with clients and I'm managing multiple strands of content, um, I use a project manager. Um, but again, you might want to do this because you can use it to manage your business as well. So Asana is organized into teams. Um, I create a team for each new client. Um, there's nothing within this that um, is, you know, private or not publicly available in any way. It just, you know, basically describes content that's being published. So it's, it's OK for me to show you this. And um, then within the team, it's organized into projects. And as you can see, I've got two projects there. And then within a project, you have either a board, this is like a Kanban board setup, um, or you can also see it in lists. Um, and on your board or your lists, um, you create tasks. Um, and I just thought I would show you, you know, just a real life example of how you can um, how you can plan out your content and organize it in advance um, and create templates and just sort of save um, some time for yourself really. So this is quite a good example of that. Um, um, so I create a template task like this. So I would duplicate this task when I want to um, create a new task for, um, you know, a, an article, you can see examples of them on the board there. And then I've pre-populated it with a little list of subtasks. Um, which represent a checklist of tasks that need to be completed um, in order for this piece of content to be created and successfully published. Um, and within each of these subtasks, you can add a due date um, and you can also assign it to people. So again, if you're working with another freelancer or uh, maybe an intern or a member of staff, um, you know, you can uh, assign it to them to do they can maybe assign it to you if they need approval and things like that so you can use it to collaborate and communicate um, and again the 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 due dates are quite good for creating a timeline of the work that you've got to um that you've got to get done in order to get this um, piece of content published and then obviously you you create the overall deadline for the piece of content the published date that you want this piece of content to go out um, as the due date for um, the task there. And there's also um, a calendar view. If you go out to the main overview, the calendar shows you basically every single um, task. So it shows all the meetings and things like that um, and all the, you know, the, the little subtasks and all those little mini deadlines. But then um, I've also created um, another board there basically that just has the published dates of the main bits of content so it's an easier view it doesn't it's not cluttered with everything you can just see what you know when content um is going out but in this very visual um you know kind of calendar layout um you can also use the likes of google calendar or outlook calendar for your content planning you know those dates that i mentioned um you know planning out your um you know the when you want to publish certain bits of content and all of the little you know mini deadlines that lead up to that and um, you know just something as simple as you know a google calendar or even a paper planner um, is really quite effective for that um, and then i just wanted to pop in and show you if i'd be able to reach it from here that's i don't know if i can actually move that out of the way ah there we go um, another tool that I use, I mentioned this, um, it is a, a tool for scheduling social media content. Um, again, I have permission to show this, there's nothing um, you know, private or private information or anything like that. Um, but it's just a really nice demonstration of you know, how you can use um, one of these third party tools, not just to post, to schedule content, but you can also use it as um, a planning tool. So as you can see, there's a calendar view and that shows this week. Um, you can also see the month view, which is quite nice to get um, a nice spread and an overview. It shows all the, the different bits of content you have um, posted or scheduled to go out on um, all the different platforms. Um, in the week view, Sorry, my computer's getting very slow. I'll probably crash off <laughs> any minute. Um, these are campaigns. Um, and if you click into those, they're quite um, useful for um, 
logging in any relevant uh, seasonal content that you might want to be aware of and, and plan um, content around. Um, and I also use the notes function, um, which is here, just to um, plan the individual pieces of content for the day. So just a little reminder of you know, the content topic we've agreed. And then I think I just wanted to look at a few examples of um, what I was talking about on home pages being like your shop front and um, the journey you take your, your buyer on there. And then some good examples of um, about pages as well. So it'd be funny. I don't actually know everyone who's watching at the minute. So it'll be funny if there's one of these creative businesses is watching. So um, the first one, the about page, obviously, you know, like I talked about having, um, you know, a good bit of written content as your, you know, your shop window, if you like. Um, Seed Head Arts are a local kind of community or like arts organization. And as you can see, they don't have a huge amount of, de you know, written content, but it's still really, really effective at, uh, you know, the up here, street art events, artists, you know, that's, that's what they do. And you can find out more by clicking there. And they have a video, obviously they're an arts organization, they're very visual. So, um, you know, that works well for them. And effectively those links really act as um, their call to action, if you like. Um, a slightly different approach is Ali Hart, who's um, a local artist, a painter. Um, and again, you can see what I'm talking about, um, that this piece of content, you know, you instantly know if you're here for, you know, a beautiful painting or, um, you know, someone who's, you know, if you're looking for colour, a pop of colour to your home, you're looking for a gift for someone you love, you know, she's covered all of those, um, all of those bases right from the start, you know, you're in the right place if you're looking for, um, you know, her work. She also goes on about, you know, she teaches um, online art workshops, you know, she it's a really comprehensive overview of everything she does um, all in one place, it's really quickly hooks you in. Scroll below to see all thanks for browsing my work. There's, you know, there's a, there's call to action there and she's even got, you know, um, video content as well. And just below there's, you know, the, the shop, which is clickable. So there's a really strong um, call to action there. Um, again, it, oh, it doesn't seem too <laughs> kind of vain. And um, just to compare, you know, my, um, my homepage, um, again, I'm no designer, as you can clearly see, certainly not a web designer. Um, but the first thing you see on my page is copywriting content and editorial. So I would hope that would give you a pretty clear idea of what it is I do. And then when I, you scroll down, this is, you know, kind of an example of what I was talking about when you think about the questions that people ask and the problems they're trying to solve. Um, and it's actually quite effective a tool to, to ask questions. Um, when you pose a question, a written question to someone, they can't help but start to look for an answer. It's kind of a natural human thing that we do. Um, so you're sort of prompting them to answer your question by posing a question. Um, and again, if you're using, if you're being informed by that keyword research um, and you're asking questions that are pretty close to the mark on why they're there, the problems they're trying to solve, um, then this should hopefully be effective. And um, so again, that's my shop front. Um, this is the sell bit that I talked about. You know, this you talk about what makes you unique. So this is a little bit about, you know, what makes me a little bit different. Um, and then I'm, you know, I'm selling what I'm doing. I'm, you know, I'm sort of going into the kind of, yes, you want me to work for you. Um, part of the pitch and then click below to find out more that's the the call to action that we spoke about and then finally finally just two more to show you um examples of um about pages and slightly different but really effective approaches to those um ruthless media lovely lady i've worked with in the past and um this is a really good example of um an about page that doesn't contain a huge amount of necessarily personal information about Ruth. Um, you know, she talks about her journey into self-employment. Um, she talks mostly about her work. In fact, pretty exclusively about her work on this page. Um, but she still manages to keep the tone really friendly and has, you know, um, really good strong images as well, which is important um, on that page. So that's an example of, you know, telling the story of your business without necessarily going into, um, you know, elaborating on a personal profile or, 
um, you know, profiling the individual themselves. And then finally, um, Astro Fibers um, is a local maker and very talented and makes, I don't know whether it's macrame or macrame, maybe somebody can tell me how to pronounce that properly. Um, but her um, about page is very personal by contrast. Um, you know, there's lots of, you know, the second word is I, I'm, you know, um, and she's talking about herself as an artist. Um, and then there's just a lot of, you know, quite emotional and personal language. Um, so you very quickly get um, the idea that this, this business is, is very personal to this person, obviously, um, and that their personal values are, you know, kind of woven into um, this business. So that's just another um, example. Just, uh, just wanted to give you a few kind of slightly contrasting examples of those about pages. Um, we talked about and I think I am finally going to shut up now so um Christine if you want to step in or if anybody has questions um I think I'll just I'll stop sharing yeah I think we had one question but I think you've answered it um oh, my yeah. only other question I know you did well <laughs> I just wanted to ask you just one more question about the Google keywords oh, is it important yeah. to use the same well first of all by the Google keywords that you mentioned that uh, software and also how many keywords should you really use and should they be the same through your website your blog and your social media or do you not need to put keywords in social media I would definitely I would use keywords everywhere the great thing about um keywords and what I try to say is that you know you're writing for humans primarily you know your content is for humans but the more searchable and friendly the robots you make it the more likely your content will get in front of those humans that you're trying to reach um it's a bit of a, a rambling way of answering that question uh, but no i think so um you know keywords should inform but not dictate all of your content um if that's useful and i do think it's it's a good idea to use as much of a variety as possible um, but if there is, you know, in the analysis that you're doing, when you use, you know, the Google keyword research tool, when you do that analysis, when you look into the, you know, the search terms, the common phrases, if there are certain words and certain phrases that are coming up a huge amount, like they're very noticeable, you know, and there's a, an obvious proportion of, okay, okay, a lot of people are using that type of language, they're not using so much of this you know, sprinkle the stuff they're not using so much and use more, you know, try to be proportionate, I think, if that's the right word. Mm -hmm. Yeah, variety is, is, you know, is the spice of life, as they say. <laughs> thank you. And thank you so much, Heather. I think that was a really lovely way to start the weekend. And I think lots of really good inspiration for everybody and lots to go away and think about. Oh, um, Heather you. has kindly agreed to share her slides. So we will pop that on our website as well as the recording of the workshop. If there's anything you kind of want to go back and return to, you can do so. So yeah, thank you, Heather. Thank you everyone who showed up, especially at the weekend, on Easter weekend. Thank you also to our funders, Ulster Bank, who are allowing us to put on this program of events. One more thing, we will have a feedback form we will be sending out. You can take a couple of minutes just to fill it in really quickly, that would be fab. Um, the next workshop we're hosting is LinkedIn Wednesday night and social media advertising the following Wednesday night. So um, please do sign up and come along to those as well.